Well, Eccellenza, my lady, my fellow academicians, and dear friends. I must confess that if I had uh, written my uh, text after reading um, the message of the Holy Father, I would have written a different text. Now, I, in my oral exposition, I shall try to make a mediation between what I had written and what I would write now if I had to rewrite the text. And um, uh, the title was Towards a Participatory Society, New Roads to, no, pardon, Participatory Democracy and the Underrepresented. Before saying a few words on the underrepresented, um, I wish to make some reflections on the idea of participatory democracy. Um, and the first point that I wish to point out is that the, uh, the first and perhaps also the last is uh, that the participatory democracy has some presuppositions, has anthropological presuppositions, has cultural presuppositions, and has political presuppositions. And perhaps the main problem we are confronted with today is that uh, these foundations of participatory democracy are shaking. Anthropological presuppositions. Well, the very idea of participatory democracy is dependent upon the idea of the free and intelligent individual. Homo est ens intelligence et liberum. Uh, St. Thomas. How is it possible that I preserve my freedom and the moral responsibility for my action that is dependent upon my freedom in an action that I lead together with others, that is, in a collective action? Participatory democracy is an attempt to answer this question. How is it possible that I can consider the action as fully mine? How can I take full responsibility for the action uh, when the action is not the action of myself as an individual, but is an action that requires the cooperation of others. And it is apparent that most actions in life require the cooperation of others. It is difficult to imagine. Uh, perhaps there are a few actions that I can perform by myself alone. But the most important ones, uh, they require uh, the cooperation of other human beings. Um, perhaps the two fundamental actions of life are the action of reproduction, and uh, uh, to make a child you need two human beings, just one is not enough, uh, at least until now, in the future we don't know, uh, and uh, uh, work, work as the action through which uh, I guarantee uh, the preservation of my life. Uh, work also as a rule, demands the cooperation of the plurality of, uh, of subjects. So how can I remain the subject of my action uh, if I have to participate on a cooperation on a, large, on, a large, on a large scale? I must add that Adam Smith has convincingly demonstrated that the divisi division of uh, labor um, increases the productivity of human labor. And this means that the level of the cooperation is uh, uh, broader and broader. I must cooperate with a even more and with a, a, a larger uh, number of people. Uh, participation is the answer. Participation is the alternative to alienation. There are two great philosophers of participation that I wish to quote, and both of them are dear also to Sua uh, Eccellenza, Monsignor Sanchez Sorondo. One of them is Cornelio Fabro, the other one was Carol Wojtyla. They both have stressed the central role of participation. Saying this, we propose um, an alternative to a merely utilitarian approach. A merely utilitarian approach tells us that um, the cooperation of many is uh, good, is positive, uh, and uh, we must ask the participation in this cooperation because the information that each one puts in his action, uh, summed up with the information of others, creates uh, a better basis for the action, for the collective action. Uh, uh, and the market is the instrument that makes the connection of 
the informative potentials of all individuals possible, which is true, but it's not a sufficient basis for uh, cooperation, uh, because, the sufficient, because in this way, you consider the efficacy of the action. The efficacy from the point of view of the change of the external world. But, the Holy Father tells us, that the action, the social action, is also another dimension, more important, uh, equally important, more important, I don't know. We can discuss this point. And this is the fact that through the action, I change myself. I create a better or a worse human being. And doing this at the same time, I create a human community or a relation, a non-communitarian relation of exploitation with other human beings. Um, um, it is the problem of uh, the common good. The common good is not a sum of individual goods. The common good is the fact that the good of the other is included in uh, my perception of my good. I am a hu an husband. I cannot think of my happiness, of my individual good, without including the good of my wife within uh, my good. And, of course, the same holds true of my daughters. And I am a grandfather, my grandchildren, and uh, why not my sisters, and my friends, and you, and uh, in the end, through progressive stages, uh, the wall of mankind, with pr different stages, the, 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 the common good of my family, of my city, of, of my nation, of Europe, and of humanity, and perhaps uh, many other uh, different uh, um, stages in, in the process. So that is the point, I think, of fraternity. Fraternity, the root of fraternity, is a different form of self-consciousness. I am conscious of myself, not just as, in, as an individual, but as a person, intending as a person, a subject of relations. The relations are constitutive of my identity. Um, up to now, we have gone along the path of Aristoteles. Aristoteles reinterpreted through, uh, in a Jewish Christian context, Boetius, with this definition of the person, St. Thomas Aquinas, and, 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 and up to Cornelio Fabro, and up to Carol Wojtyła. Now I wish to add uh, another dimension. The idea of society that we have is strictly dependent upon the idea of man that we have. Um, uh, uh, well, Hobbes said this, but also Plato said this much before Hobbes. Um, we are dependent in our idea of society on the idea of man that we have. If we have a, 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 the idea of man as a commu communal subject, a subject made for communio, for koinonia, then we have a society that corresponds to this idea. Or we can imagine a society that is uh, the expression of this kind of man. But this uh, idea of man is not something only metaphysical. It is something historical. I do not want now to, uh, deny, de uh, to deny the importance of metaphysics, not at all. But St. Thomas Aquinas uh, has written that nihil potest de potentia deduci in actum, nisi per aliquo dens in actum. Uh, what is impotency can be brought into act only through a subject in act. So the communal man, this communal potentiality that is ontically intrinsic to each human being, uh, becomes actual in a context in which there is somebody else who already has the experience in act of this way of being human. As a rule, there is the father and the mother. We grow in it, and uh, Professor Dumont has said this very well, very clearly, the, the first impression that we have in the family, they form our personality. And the communal personality is something that is uh, ontical, but something that is historical at the same time. And the development of the communal personality is to a large extent dependent on the existence of a specific kind of family. One mother, one father, the interaction between one child, one father, one mother, and if possible, some siblings. Uh, remember Schiller, the, the hymn of the European Union, uh, uh, um, 
Bruder über Sternenfeld muss sein lieber Vater wohnen. Uh, brothers, beyond uh, the starry uh, sky, there must be a father who loves us. No father, no brothers. No father, no idea of brotherhood, no fraternity. But fraternity is the basis of a living, a thriving political community, also political community, in the sense that the political community is dependent upon, upon the pre-existence of other communities, family community, civil society community, and so forth. Without a thriving family, no thriving civil society. Without a thriving civil society, no thriving political community. And now, uh, uh, we live uh, uh, the crisis of the family. So uh, the first problem I wish to put is the problem of marriage. Marriage is uh, the social machinery, the social instrument through which sexual instinct, eros, is transformed into agape. And the energy of eros becomes the energy that constructs society. Um, Pope Benedict XVI has written beautiful pages exactly on this point. Eros and uh, Agape. Well, Lindgren, much before uh, Josef Ratzinger had uh, seen this thema, but the Pope has seen something more than what was already, already a commonplace. Uh, and uh, if we lose the marriage, we lose uh, the possibility of creating um, um, communal personalities. And then how can we have a participatory society? It becomes more difficult. Sometimes we hear that neither the state nor the church should stick their noses into what consenting adults do under the sheets of their bed. This is perhaps not entirely true because exactly this transformation of Eros into Agape generates the energy invested in working for the family and for society and shapes the personality of the children and therefore uh, society at large. Participation is an essential feature of the Christian personality, a social reflex of the ontological reality of communio. I shall not repeat the discussion we have had this morning um, on the way in which in this the natural and the supernatural are distinct but also linked together. Because in any society, even in a non-Christian society, you find elements of this communal personality, but at the same time, you find that they cannot flourish. And by the way, in Christian society, you must not idealize Christian societies, because in Christian societies, we always stand under uh, the, dom the, the dominance of the original sin. And so, uh, the real existing family, um, the Pope in uh, Amoris Laetitia, <laughs> a sobering paragraph on this point, well, is full of uh, problems, injustices. For many centuries, women have been mistreated, and uh, the resentment of mistreated women has, is one of the causes of the decline uh, or of difficulties of the families today. We must find new balance, and so forth and so forth. But without uh, any idealization, I, I think we must stress this fact. Uh, the fundamental idea of our civilization, that is, that of a person who is at the same time individual and universal, who encompasses others in the definition of his own good, is the result of specific family structures. And it is doubtful whether it will survive the end of these family structures. Um, think of Hegel. Um, Hegel expresses this, f this ideal in the form of the coincidence of the universal and the particular. Kant, in uh, his idea that uh, we act, ac that our individual act uh, is done according to principles that can be assumed as a maxim of universal legislation. Max Orkheimer has pointed out the relation obtaining between this principle and the structure of the family. Pierpaolo Donati and Margaret Archer have reformulated the same concept, insofar as I understand, uh, in their relational sociology. And last but not least, Cicero, who was not a Christian, but uh, was a keen observer of human nature, has written that familia seminarium rei publice. The family is uh, the place in which the political community is generated. So uh, sometimes, uh, we find uh, uh, some, a certain division 
There are those who defend um, the family, uh, uh, the so-called uh, non-negotiable values, uh, and, uh, and so forth. And others who defend participatory democracy are interested in the problem of participation. You cannot separate these two domains. They are intrinsically linked to one another. If one of them falls down, uh, the other will not survive. Now, now, a participatory democracy is based on a system of mediations. Um, all different converging and diverging social interests are allowed to participate in a free discussion. And at the end, a, dis a decision has to be taken. Um, a decision has to be taken. Uh, we must avoid um, to forget that the discussion the participation must end with the decision. Uh, a great reason for the collapse of uh, uh, Western democracies, I mean the Italian and the German democracy in front of National Socialism, was the incapacity to reach decision. Uh, decision is not the contrary of participation, although sometimes it may seem so. Decision is uh, intrinsically linked to participation. We discuss in order, in the end, to do something. If we uh, if this discussion becomes an end in itself, if participation becomes an end in itself and is not linked to the further end of the common action, then, then, uh, then our democracies we are, are not likely to survive for long. The political body lives in a delicate balance between representation and decision. In some modern democracy, uh, what we see now is that it is difficult to create majority coalitions to govern. And on the other hand, minority, minorities tend to expand the area of interests that they consider vital and non-negotiable. The process of political mediation works well if the majority has a certain self-restraint. I do not want to push my victory up to the point of making life intolerable for my opponents. And on the other hand, uh, the minority, they love our community so much that I am ready to accept uh, rulings that uh, do not correspond to what they would have wished. But if, on the one hand, the non-negotiable uh, values are pushed too far, and on the other hand, the majority wants to exert to the utmost possible extension its power, the result is the disruption of society. Now, on both sides, we see that there, there is a growing tendency of majorities to pretend too much and of minorities to be willing to yell too little. The result is the paralysis of the political decision or the attempt to govern with less consent. Um, Italy is a good example. Or the discussion on political reform in Italy, in the end, uh, wants to produce a mechanism, an electoral law, for instance, that allows us to govern with less consent, which can be a, a provisional solution to the problem. But in the long run, uh, in the long run, um, it is no real solution. How can we ensure an efficient participation that is a participation that produces decisions? In the long run, the answer is, um, an educational one. The real problem is education of different kind of personality, of personality that is more communal. In the short run, we have, uh, 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 the problem must be seen also in another perspective. Luciano Canfora has convincingly, convincingly contended that the political life of Greek democracies was centered around the demand of redistribution in favor of the poor. And the great success, success of the Western democracy was due to a large extent to the fact that they enjoyed for many years of very high rates of economic growth. High rates of economic growth make it possible on the one hand to have enough resources to invest to keep the economy growing and enough resources to finance generous redistributive policies. The present crisis and uh, the growth of uh, the so-called 
populist uh, movements uh, is largely depend up, dependent upon the fact that the poor of the earth have started working, they uh, have uh, uh, bettered their situation, they make us com a, a strong competition, and um, we have no more the resources for both things, to finance development and to finance generous uh, redistributive policies. And this produces an extreme polarization. It is difficult to say what is the, the answer. Uh, well, the answer, uh, it is clear. Uh, we should have the capacity of uh, uh, investing in knowledge economy so that we leave some kinds of productions to the growing countries and preserve a, a certain advantage that allows us to maintain uh, a, a good living standards so that they grow and become richer and we do not become poor. But this demands um, a mobilization of all the resources that we have, the capacity to make sacrifices, a common project for the future, a higher level of virtue, of political virtue, that can be found today. So whether we will succeed in this, it remains doubtful. But let us set this aside now, because what I wanted uh, was not to try to find solutions, but just to give an idea of the problems of participatory democracy we are confronted with. Now, I wish to go to the demand, who are the underrepresented? And I shall answer from the perspective of the society in which I live, that is from the point of view of a Western society. Well, the first underrepresented by us are the young, the future, the environment. We live in a society in which uh, um, a large number of people are old. We have few young and uh, many old people. And many of the old people are not grandparents, are not even parents. And they are not vitally interested in the future. I have 12 grandchildren and I am interested in the world, the way in which the world will be in 100 years. Because my children, no, my children perhaps not, but the, uh, my grandchildren, not even my grandchildren, but the children of my grandchildren will be there. Many people are not interested in the way in which the world will be in 50 years, in 30 years, in 20 years. They're interested in what will happen in the next uh, 10 to 20 years until the time when they probably will be dead. So we have a tremendous pressure for redistributive policies in favor of the older generation, and we do not succeed in generating sufficient political consensus for policies that uh, invest to create jobs for the young people, policies that preserve the environment for the young people, uh, policies that preserve the right to the future of the young people. The reasons of the young people, of children, children do not vote, you know, but the reasons of children are underrepresented. Once upon a time, everybody had children, and everybody more or less was interested into the future. Now it is n this does not hold true anymore. We have a strong pressure to underrepresent the point of view of the, the young. A second kind of underrepresentation has a different character. Um, we have. Uh, generous social policies in our countries, and we have also an important uh, uh, bureaucracy, people who live out of uh, the state expenditures. They usually are more politically active than those who uh, live out of uh, uh, jobs that stand on the market. And there is a strong pressure to uh, increase the public expenditures, out of which uh, the public sector is financed. And so we have a, a struggle between the two sections of the people. Uh, there is a third uh, group of people who are not underrepresented, but feel underrepresented. This is the most dangerous group of people. It is the middle class. Um, the revolution of the knowledge economy generates one section of the people who are in this revolution and become affluent. They are ready to pay high taxes, uh, to uh, make some kind of charities to the poor. Those who stand in the middle, who don't want to become poor, 
who don't want to be out of state assistance, but on the other hand, do not have the instruments to enter into the knowledge economy, they feel frustrated. They want to preserve their autonomy, but they feel threatened. They feel that things will not be so good for their children as they were for them. And they will not be so good in the future as they used to be in um, the past. And this is uh, uh, the main root of a new populism. We were used to think that populism is a phenomenon of some um, more or less underdeveloped country. Now we have a populism of the rich countries. We have our own populism. Uh, and uh, this is very dangerous because it can influence um, the decisions of leaders who hold a tremendous power uh, for peace or for war, for good or for evil, for economic growth or for uh, the regression of mankind. Here, the cause of the underrepresentation is not a lack of electoral or political power, but rather a lack of cultural and political vision. We have not a vision of a way of developing our societies in which we can foster the growth of all of society at the same time. Um, Antonio Gramsci was a Marxist, but he was also an Italian, uh, and therefore could not be thoroughly bad, and <laughs> understood a lot about politics, and he makes an important distinction between a rough or corporate or immediate representation of the interest of a social class or group and a political, mediated, hegemonic representation. Um, a non-political representation is a representation in which one tries to impose his will on the others. A political representation is a way in which one tries to create a coalition in which his interest, the interest of his group, of his nation, is made compatible with the interests of others and is linked to the interests of others so that he can create a coalition that governs a certain process. Uh, some of you will be, su will be surprised if I say that this idea in a revised and enlarged form can be found in the encyclical Pacem Interris of Saint uh, John the 23rd. According to the great pontiff, peace is the first and foremost purpose, the telos, the entelecheia, the form of politics as such. There is a difference with Gramsci. Gramsci wants to make a coalition uh, to struggle against uh, uh, capitalism. Um, John XXIII wants to make a coalition to uh, lead all of humanity, a coalition encompassing not some countries against other countries, but all of humanity. Towards what? In, uh, in, uh, uh, in a encyclical, in Pacem Intelligence, it's not completely clear. It becomes more clear in Popularum Progressio. In Popularum Progressio, um, the the common purpose is further elucidated. It is the integral growth of humanity. And from Centesimus Annus to Caritas in Veritate to Evangelii Gaudium, we have a further qualification uh, that finally becomes to orient and govern globalization in order to allow all countries and all of humanity to grow together. I wish to mention in this connection Chiara Lubich. Chiara Lubich translated the doctrine of the Pope into the concept of politics as a service to the unity of mankind. And this corresponds, in my opinion, uh, very well to the real intention of these great uh, popes. But now, all the more alarming is the fact that today major political forces strive to formulate their particular interest, national or social alike, in a non-mediated and non-political form, or at least in a way that is not political in the sense of pacem interis and of the following encyclicals. It seems, it seems that another idea of politics is growing, and this can be reduced, uh, uh, it's a movement back from uh, John the 23rd to Gramsci, or even worse, to Carl Schmitt. Politics 
is the decision that divides the world in two, friend and foe. So politics needs force, or at least takes into account the possibility of creating uh, them. Um, I have nothing against those who say Italy first, or Germany first, or perhaps America first. Only I have a doubt. I, I like Italy to be first in football, in science, but I have the doubt that this means really, as I have heard and, uh, and, and, and read sometimes, uh, my country first and the, devil, and the devil take care of others. That would be wrong. Now, we are losing this idea. Now I come to the conclusion. Machiavelli, another Italian who was not thoroughly bad and had a keen understanding of politics, has put on paper the fundamental principle uh, of, uh, uh, of politics, of democratic politics. The people will always make the right decision if and only if a responsible political class and a wise institutional framework proposes clear alternatives and explains the possible consequences of the course of action taken. In thinking of participatory democracy, we should never forget the problem of the anthropological and cultural presupposition of a participatory democracy. It was the purpose of this contribution to attract your attention exactly on this point. Thank you. Thank you.